My mother sat next to me. I was a boy. I was lying face down on the couch. Some of you will remember when couches, it was at least in our family and maybe in your family too, kind of a hip thing to have. Remember those clear vinyl covered couches? Yeah. Had little bumps in it. I was lying down, face down on the couch. I was at sixes and sevens, as Lance and Jan might say. Spent about what, I don't know, probably I'd let a ball go through my legs playing shortstop. I'd missed a tackle. Maybe that's what I'd done. Or I'd missed a free throw that could have won the game. Something important. She said it once, but I would go on hearing her saying it to me again and again for the rest of my life. Stroking my sweaty hair, she said, Oh, Philip, don't be like an oak tree. Storm come. Wind come, oak tree, strong, rigid, resist the wind, oak tree, break, fall down. No, be like a bamboo tree, she said. Bamboo tree, wind, the storm come, wind come. Bamboo, bend with the wind. Storm, done. Bamboo tree, reach to the sun. What allows bamboo to do that? I I have a feeling some of you have a a tortured relationship with bamboo. (laughs) What allows bamboo to be so persistent and pervasive and maybe invasive and resilient? I don't know about you, but I've always, or for a long time, I assumed it could do that because its trunk is flexible, weak. But on the Janka scale, the Janka hardness scale, it's a measurement that woodworkers are familiar with. Bamboo is actually much harder than oak or maple. You can take a ball-peen hammer or a sledgehammer and hit some bamboo as hard as you want, and you won't leave a dent in it. Do that to oak or maple, and you'll notice the bruise. What makes the bamboo resilient or strong, fiercely vital, is what's going on beneath the soil. What's going on that you can't lay eyes on? Their root systems reach out to each other and hang on to each other. I was telling Philip this the other day. They hang on to each other. They don't do this alone. If they're alone, they aren't going to do that. But together, they reach out to one another beneath the soil, and they hang on. That is a picture of the church, and that is a picture of what we celebrate today on the solemnity of all saints. All saints, like Christmas, is an immovable feast, Christmas is always on the 25th of December. You never have to wonder about that. All Saints is always on the 1st of November. But within the octave, within seven days after All Saints Day, the 1st of November, churches properly transfer that celebration to the next Sunday, as we do today. We reach out to one another. And to people beneath 
the soil, as it were, or if you want a different image, to that great cloud of witnesses, saints who've gone before us. Witnesses establish the truth by giving evidence. Today, as we celebrate the saints, we venerate those who have given evidence, who have made God believable by how they lived and how they died. To paraphrase the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, God does not make himself credible by argument. God does not respond to our doubts by delivering from heaven a neat list of logical propositions with which we cannot disagree. God deals with you and me, with us, by our life and by a life and a death, by Jesus. And God continues to deal with us by lives and deaths that make God credible that make Jesus tangible here and now. We may not be called by God to die a martyr's death. I always think this time of the year of Lawrence, perhaps I've told you about him before. I call him the patron saint of American football. Lawrence was told by the proconsul to bring all the churches poor to the arena and present them, or sorry, to bring all the church's treasures to the arena and present them to Caesar. So he did what he was told. And when the day appointed for him to do that came, he appeared before the proconsul. He was a deacon. He appeared before the proconsul with all the church's poor which made the proconsul livid. So they made, manufactured a gridiron. This is where American football comes in. And uh, they built a fire beneath that. Imagine a waffle iron big enough on which to roast a man. They, they made a waffle iron, a gridiron, and put him on it. And after a while, fire burning, Lawrence, he must have been a tough old bird. Lawrence said, I think I'm done on this side. You can turn me over now. We may not do what Lawrence did, but you and I, you and I can give evidence of the power of the Spirit of God to strengthen us, to give witness to make God credible together with each other and with all the saints. And we can do that under any circumstances, no matter how difficult, no matter how strong the wind. You know, on offer in the church, there are, at we might say, opposite ends of the spectrum, two ways of thinking about saints. On one On one end, you've got the notion that, well, you know, all of us can be just as much saints as Teresa of Avila or Lawrence or someone else. All you have to do is be walking around and you're a saint. I don't have a lot of sympathies with that. Um, If by saint we mean somebody formally recognized as a saint by the church. On the other end of the spectrum, in the Roman Catholic tradition, you've got to have somebody attest that you've performed a miracle. I, for what it's worth, prefer that splendid definition articulated by our prayer book back in 15, the original prayer book in 1549, Saints there are described as, and I quote, the choice vessels of God's grace and the lights of the world in their several generations. Isn't that wonderful? By that definition, we understand how those in that great cloud of witnesses can encourage us right now. 
as if we're running a race and they're cheering us on, holding on to us as we hold on to the glory of God made manifest in, among other things, the body of Christ. You don't have to be a miracle worker. You can be a vessel of God's grace, and you are a light to the world in your generation. That is within our reach. That is what All Saints inspires me to do. I was reading the hymn for All the Saints early this week. It's one of the, one of the hymns, one of about a dozen hymns that I don't think I've ever sung completely because I could just never get through it. Break, I just break down crying. There's another hymn, though. I can get through it. It's, um, it's in our hymnal. It's about the saints of God. And it goes like this. I'll end with this. I sing a song of the saints of God. It's written for children, but all of us are children inside, aren't we? Lesbia Scott's great hymn, I sing a song of the, great, of the saints of God, patient and brave and true, who toiled and fought and lived and died for the Lord they loved and knew. And one was a doctor, and one was a queen, and one was a shepherdess on the green. They were all of them saints of God, and I mean... God helping to be one too. They loved their Lord so dear, so dear, and God's love made them strong. And they followed the right for Jesus' sake the whole of their good lives long. And one was a soldier, and one was a priest, and one was slain by a fierce wild beast. And there's not any reason, no, not the least, why I shouldn't be one too. They lived not only in ages past, there are hundreds of thousands still. The world is bright with the joyous saints who love to do Jesus' will. You can meet them in school or in lanes, or at sea, in church, or in trains, or in shops, or at tea. For the saints of God are just folk like me, and I mean to be one too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.